Okay, well today we're looking at chapter two, which is theoretical considerations of mass media. Some of this is a recap. Now before I go on, I do want to say a couple things. Uh, lab, how'd it go on Friday? You guys understand what's required of this class? And if you didn't want to do that, you're going to ask me for a drop sheet, right? Because it's kind of like a contract. Um, in addition, um, office hours. What are your office hours, Mr. Downey? How about you, Mr. Knoll? Uh, most of you guys already know, but it's Mondays and Wednesdays after class. And where are, is your office located? Sec 280 Fell. Fell, second floor, 280. Excellent. All right. Um, I, it's like a big cubicle area where they like hurt all the grad students. And I'm like tucked way back in the corner, but you can just scream my name and find me. So. All right. Ask anybody. They'll know where Downey is. And they'll know where you are too. Um, okay. I, I did want to recap a little bit on... Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's just do that when we get to it, on realization. I mean, what is realization? There's a little bit of question about that. It's when the, when the main characters realize implicitly or explicitly what their goal is, what their dramatic question is, and they realize the difficulty they're going to have facing that. So it's when Frodo realizes it's going to be his job to get rid of the ring. And he wants, have you seen it? The Lord of the Rings, okay, who is the Lord of the Rings? Right, he tries to pass it off to Gandalf, and what if Gandalf says? Don't tempt me, and they do some cool visual effect where he like gets big and dark, you know what I mean? So, but you understand, Bridget, that was the point that Frodo realized it was all on him, right? It was on him to get rid of that ring. Um, I watched a great movie called Mud this weekend. Has anybody seen Mud? Uh, you raise your hand if you have. It, well, you know, Matt McConaughey is such a dish anyways, but uh, it's really good, and I could watch it with Woody. Um, and there was a point where these two boys find this guy hiding on an island, but they realize he's a good guy, and they decide to help him. But they also realize how hard it is going to be because there's a boat in a tree and he's going to bring that boat down to escape. So it was that realization point. This is my will and want, this main kid character protagonist said, but it's going to be hard to do that. And mud, all of it is involved with the realization. I mean, it can be more explicit, it can be less explicit, but it's where the main character realizes what their goal is and how hard that is to going to be to achieve that goal. Comprende? All right. Um, so today we are moving forward. We're going to talk about theories that are relevant to convergent media uh, writing. And this is a really big lecture, and I'm going to try to compact it down. And along with that, some of the stuff we're going to cover, it's good for you to be familiar with, but you're not going to have to know. I will tell you what's on the test. I'm very good about that. So don't try to write everything down, but do write down what I suggest. Okay, you guys got that? All right, so today, the first half of the lecture, we're going to look at a transactional model of communication, the purposes of communication, message types, some theoretical communication, characteristics of good writing, and structural considerations. And those last two are just going to be review. But let's go forward and look at a transactional model of communication. Go ahead. Um, the idea here is that all communication is two-way, okay? There is a speaker and a, uh, a speaker or a sender. It can be a television station that broadcasts through the air or th um, through your cable television. It's the radio station that sends out a message. It's whoever originates the web page and sends it to you. They fe send you that Facebook post. It's the people that decide to put the ad at the side of the road. They're the sender, right? Uh, and any that, then what they're doing is they're sending a message, okay? And then there's the receiver or the listener. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, we're going to talk about how to consider audiences. But we always want to consider who the audience is. Go to the next slide for just one second. Okay, I, I guess, well, let's go back to the model. Do you guys have the model? What page is the model on in the textbook? 
page 12. There you have it. There's a model. It's a, a transactional model. And the key to realize is that communication is not one way, but it's two way. All right. Certainly we are listeners to all the messages that we're barraged with, but we also can provide feedback in another message back to the sender. Do you see that? It's a two way process. And it's very important that we understand that. Um, you know, if we identify the particular components, we see that there is a sender, there is a message, there's a listener, there's the context of the communication. Um, but I also want to talk about interference. Why don't you go up to, um, can you uh, just tap up there to focus on that? There you go. There is interference. So that's one of the parts of this process. We get, how many mess, mass media messages do we get a day? <laughs> The, the word for the day is ubiquitous. What does ubiquitous mean? Yes. Yeah, just constant bombardment. Um, everywhere you turn. I mean, I bring it. What is that on yours? Is it, what, what is that? Is it Venezuela? Oh, it's part of Michigan? Okay, we got Star Wars going here, which I like. Looks like the first Marvel comic. Star Wars? Okay, good. But how many people do a festival? What's that festival? Festival ISU. Oh, Festival ISU. Just, bears just do it. We have all kinds of ads right now, right? I'm not even hooked up to any mass media. I mean, Facebook, I got banner ads. I got, if I turn on the TV, there's all kinds of messages come at me, commercial messages. I read the vedette this morning. I glanced through it. Of course, the most important part of the vedette, I love the vedette. Is identified as by the Uni Reader as one of the top 10 independent publications in America several years ago. By you and I, the most important part of the vedette is the uh, University Liquors ad, First Sight, and Redbird Properties, right? I mean, take a look at it. That's where most, I mean, it's like 40, 30 to 40 percent is actual news and the rest is ads, you know, because the vedette is a business. My point is that there's all these messages coming through and that creates interference. What you have to do is make your message uniquely, unique and, uh, and attractive and, and get attention um, and motivate your audience. Um, you have to cut through the dim of ubiquitous mass medias. I could talk about strategic ambiguity. Um, strategic ambiguity is when I, I um, when there, my communication is open-ended and you can interpret various ways. The key thing that's interference for our purposes is bad writing. Okay? Page nine, who sent me the email about that mistake? Okay, did you send me the email? Yeah. Okay, well, when you saw that mistake, it distracted you from what my real message was, was when you're buying ad time, you need to be concise. But suddenly that message that I was intending to impart to you was overshadowed by the bad writing. So what you want to do is in decrease the interference by making your writing clear, concise, correct, and complete. And in that regard, on that one page, I failed, despite the fact that it's gone through 40 rewrites. And if I have to revise, rewrite, and uh, repeat it ad nauseum, I would propose that you're going to need to do the same thing as well. That's just the reality of life. All right? So interference is... <sighs> Uh, so there's a channel, and the, no, yeah, 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 sit there if you would. Go back. There you go. Uh, there's a channel through which the communication goes to, and then there's. Um, wait, could you focus on the listener and the speaker? I want to say that for each audience, can you scoot that down just a little bit? There you go. Um, for each uh, receiver, we're going to call the listener an audience. I want you to write this down. Intended audience, and what is an intended audience? What do you think an intended audience is? Yes? The people I'm trying to reach. And what we need to know is who is our intended audience? I'm in public relations. What is our intended audience called? Public. Very good. That's going to be on the test. But I don't know if it's on the midterm. But for you PR people, that's what we're talking about, the target audience. And for each of our target audience, there are demographic features. And I go in detail in the book on this. There is age of the listener, the audience member, the intended audience. How much money do they make? What's their education? What's their gender? Look, if I'm trying to write, uh, sell the new version of a first-person shooter game, do I put uh, that ad on reruns of the Golden Girls? 
No. Where do I put that ad? That television ad? ESPN, ESPN there. Because, because that's where your intended audience is, your target audience. Very good. You guys get this? So my point is that you have to know who your intended audience is, who your target audience is, so you can not only aim for them through the right channels and the right medium, but also you want to... I mean, are you going to have old people in your ad playing the first-person shooter game? And I mean, I mean, maybe some old guys really love those games. And old women, I'm sure, love blowing punks away in the street. But mostly, you know, it's younger males who play these games. They tend to. I don't want to. Am I being hasty? How many women play? How many of the women in here play first-person shooter games? Okay, a couple. How many guys play first-person shoot, shooter games in this room? A little bit more. Okay, so I'm trying to reach you. And I want to reach you too. Who was it that raised their hand? All right, I want to reach you, Summer. I want to reach you, okay. Um, but the point is, you guys understand, I need to know who my intended audience is, the target audience, and I need to be able to address that. It's theoretically wise to know that. Do you understand? All right, great. Uh, what did you uh, pull back out? Feedback. Okay, now the sender sends feedback to the, the receiver sends feedback to the resender, and then they become a sender. What are, what's the primary, the most important form of feedback for television and cable? Uh, raise, raise your hand. Ratings. Ratings, and I say that in the book, don't I? Put a star by it, that's on the first test. The most important form of feedback to a TV station and lose the ratings, because the deal, guys, is that the station sells you, the audience, to an advertiser. They say, we know he's watching, and we're going to sell you his attention at this given time. He's watching. Do you watch Sports Center? Okay. So they say, we know he's watching Sports Center, so we're going to sell you, Gillette, his attention. But they need ratings to show Gillette they've got your attention. You see? So the most important for form of feedback for convergent media really is ratings. And it also could be, what are some other forms of feedback in uh, convergent media? Yes. Sales, definitely. If Gillette advertise on ESPN and their sales goes up, very good answer. That is a form of feedback to say, hey man, I'm being receptive. I buy that I want Gillette, right? Yeah, Superman, shave. Did you guys see those ads? I didn't even see the new Superman. Who saw it? Was it good? Okay. Well, that's why I didn't pay. I didn't pay eight bucks to go see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I don't know, Superman, you know what the deal with Superman is? He just doesn't have any fault. He doesn't seem like a human to me. Now, this one, maybe he was more human. He's, hey, he's not a human. Well, there you go. I kind of like Peter Parker because he's got, like, girlfriend problems. and uh, uh, Raise your hand. What? Okay, okay, well, you got to go. You can watch the first three, too, or go back and... You guys, you know, Tommy McGuire, man, he's an award-winning actor. He won 2001 Best Kisser Award, <laughs> right? For, how many people saw the Upside Down Kiss? It was award-winning. Anybody see Tropical Thunder? Did you? The Devil's Alley. Do you remember that with Tommy McGuire and uh, um, Robert Downey Jr.? Anyways, I, I digress. My point is, um, Gillette tried to sell to young people who saw Superman, and that was their target audience. Now, many people may not have buy Gillette or whatever the shaving company was, and then that feedback said this wasn't a successful advertising. Okay? So sales. What other are some forms of feedback? Yes, sir. Complaints, sure, man. I mean, we can email when um, Arrested Development was going to be, you know, axed by Fox, um, you know, back way back when. Lots of emails came into Fox, and that was a form of feedback where people demanded they keep it on the air. Yes. Those definitely are a form of feedback. I bet you Miley was taking a look at the Twitter feeds this morning. Was she good or not? <laughs> she was horrible. <laughs> Miley grows up. <laughs> There's nothing like... Okay, there's nothing like salvio divinorum and a bong, you know? Uh, 
Okay, okay, okay. But but that is a form of feedback. Twitter tweets back um, are certainly a form of feedback. Summer. Yeah, absolutely. And some of that is ratings. Nielsen Rating Company um, sends out, and, and at one point I was in their loop, they give me a little bit of money to say what I watched every week. So that's definitely a form of feedback. Yes, sir? Pardon? Yeah, I was talking about it right now. Could be potentially feedback. I mean, I'm not going to run out and buy Miley Cyrus for a couple of years. I did. I got an 11 year old girl and a 9 year old boy, so Miley Cyrus got like 10% of my income there for a couple of years. I went and saw that concert, like 3D, it cost me 15 bucks a pop. I mean, I should have $45 to take us to it, man. And uh, all I want to be is a fly on the wall. I, I have to admit, that's in our album collection. <laughs> that's kind of sad, isn't it? But so is Baby, Baby, Baby. I, what are you going to do? Um, Thankfully, now Woody likes Green Day and the Bruce Springsteen is Maggie's favorite, so. But the, yeah, that's a lot better than Justin Boobner and uh, Miley Cyrus. Yes, sir. One of the things like searches and clicks on blogs. Yes, searches and clicks on blogs. That is a very good form of feedback right now. Likes on web pages. I mean, State Farm has a Facebook page and likes are feedback to them. Or then they have sub. Uh, Facebook pages where they're on a particular campaign and likes are feedback to them. So just recognize that there is feedback, but the most important one for our purposes is what? Ratings. Ratings. Okay. So uh, that's the transactional model of communication. Just know that it's two way. Once you go ne to the next slide, and we'll talk particularly about what kind of messages, what are the purposes of communication? This is on the test. Write this down. Purposes of communication. Certainly to inform. What is informing? What does that mean? To inform means what? To provide information. To entertain. What's that? You can tell that I kind of adopted a somewhat of an entertainment paradigm in this class. I want you to think this is a fun class to come to, right? That's why we play Rage Against the Machine at the front and the end of class, you know? I try to be animated. Um, so to entertain, right? But ultimately, what's the goal of the mass media business, ladies and gentlemen? To get you to buy, that's right. And that's a sermonic function. It's kind of like sermon, to persuade you. What they want you to do is tune in after the commercials. They want to convince you to sit there during the commercials and to be there when they come back from the commercials, right? So they're always trying to get you to watch and to stay there so you can watch the commercials. There's a persuasive function. So all of these are potential purposes of communication. Do you understand that? Even if it just, look, if it's the sermonic function, if, if I say it's raining outside, but you got an umbrella, what's your name again? Taylor. Taylor. And you have an umbrella, is there some sermonic function? Hey man, it's really raining out there. What I mean, might I be persuading you to do? Use your umbrella or share it with me. Well, man, my suit's going to get wrecked in this rain, dude. You know what I mean? Like, you, we've all, what's that? Right, right, slightly passive aggressive, but nevertheless, it's an attempt to be persuasive. I could just say, hey man, could you share your umbrella with me? But oh man, it's raining cats and dogs. But you're right, it is kind of passive aggressive. But, I, I, but then I'm not imposing, you know, I mean, but you understand it could, what apparently is just informing sometime is also persuasive, right? Tune in next week, you know, to see what happens on The Bachelor. Well, well, that's, that's obviously persuasive, isn't it? Okay, so they want to get you to watch. Purposes of communication is definitely on the test. Go forward, sir. That's the sermonic function. It might seem to be just informing or entertaining, but there also is a persuasive function, which is to get you to watch and then ultimately to get you to buy products, right? They want you to buy more Clarisol. They want you to buy a new Nissan. They want you to consume. Bottom line, yes, ma'am. What's that? Go back for a second. Well, there's always a sermon, there is a suggestion by Weaver, there's always a sermonic function. Even when it seems like someone is, in, is just informing you, look, I'm just informing you, but I'm also trying to persuade you to write it down and to know it for the test, aren't I? Yeah. 
All of them have a sermonic function according to Weaver. And I'll kind of stand by that. What's that? No, no, no. All three of those can have and most of the time do have a sermonic function. I mean, my girlfriend may say, you're late. But man, there's a sermonic function. Well, I'm going to hear a sermon probably after that. So, you know, there's a sermonic function, right? Which is, why are you late? Am I not important enough for you to be on time? Well, if that's the case, then... Okay, fine, fine. Um... I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get, me, get me some flowers and chocolate now. Maybe <laughs> that's the underlying message. If I'm late, I better be bearing gifts to feed the beast, right? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's a hidden or oftentimes it's implicit. It's a secondary message. It really means that even when I'm informing or, or, or entertaining, I'm also trying to persuade you. Yeah, it's an underlying goal. Because bottom line is they don't care if they entertain you. They, you can be bored to death as long as you sit through the commercials. I mean, that's the business. Do you think that the... Look, I own stock in all kinds of stuff for my retirement. I don't even know what the stocks are, okay? Some of them might be media companies. Do I care if you're entertained? I only care if my retirement fund gets strong. Do you see what I'm saying? At this level, in the market, I, we're so detached. The owners are so detached. They just want you to buy stuff. <laughs> is, that, is that cool? There's a sermonic function oftentimes in what is apparently just informing or entertaining. I'll go ahead. Yeah, pass that. Thank you. There he goes. Uh, message types. There's three types of message. The intended message. What is an intended message? Yes. Very good. The idea that I hope to impart to you is my intended message. Then there is an actual message. And what's that? Yes, ma'am. The message that the audience processes, the meaning that they actually get from the utterance or the sign or the symbol, okay? And then what is residual message? Yes. It's what you're left with. Residual message, you leave class and you're going to remember a few things. And I'm hoping that the residual message are, are the things that I said, this is important, right? And I hope that after you take the class, that those six things we started the class with, which I'm going to reiterate throughout the semester, are going to be on your mind, okay? Now, the best communication occurs when the intended message, what I hope to get, across to you. The idea is what you hear and retain. That is the best communication that can occur. When the intended message matches up with the actual message, and then that's the residual message, the message that you go away with. Now what I want to talk about is this idea of signs. Is that the next slide? If it isn't, it sure should be. Yes. It's very important for us to consider this idea of encoding and decoding. Okay? Encoding and decoding. Look at those notes. Excellent. So what is encoding? Choosing signs that will evoke a certain response. Very good. Those are killer notes. Good job, guys. Encoding is when I want to get across a particular idea in my consciousness. So I choose words which are really signs and symbols to try to invoke in your mind a certain meaning. Okay? But what we as writers have to do is be very cognizant of the encoding process so we choose the correct words and make the correct sentences and the, uh, the best slogan that's possible so that the message is decoded as we intend it to be coded. And what does decoding mean? You got great notes. Decoding is... So the receiver takes the signs and then attributes meaning to them, right? I mean, it's a kind of a magical process. I mean, I say a house in the woods. It's red. It's dark. But there's a fire out front. And a group of friends play the guitar and drink lemonade. And I've painted a picture in your mind, haven't I? And that's magic, and that's the encoding and decoding process. What words do I choose to try to cr help you create a mental picture in your mind? And I don't know, the example I like, I used to like uh, be a big advocate for the uh, Chicago Art Institute because I got in free as a state 
teacher, they change their policy, so I don't know, you can go or not. Because I used to tell everybody, go, it's awesome, but they took away my free deal status, so. Ah, you, you can go or not. But anyways, me and Maggie are there. Maggie's like five. And we see a Jackson Pollock. How many people know Jackson Pollock's work? How would you typify Jackson Pollock's work? Yes. Chaos, Chaos splatters, drips, you know. It's, it's very postmodern, um, impressionistic. And we're sitting in front of this giant one. And how many people have maybe seen a Jackson Pollock at Chicago Institute of Art? Okay. Well, you probably saw the one that we're looking at. And I said to Maggie, she's five, I said, what is it? And she looked at it and she said, well, it's obviously a snowstorm, Daddy. <laughs> right? And ultimately, it was. Because meaning is constituted in the consciousness of the receiver. She, interacting with Jackson Pollock, who's long since died of alcoholism, and the text that he presented, the giant canvas, the meaning was constituted in the interaction between her consciousness and Jackson and that canvas. It kind of looks like a snowstorm too, doesn't it? I mean, it's pretty good. Although it could be anything, right? Oh, it's a state of uh, post-modern man's existential angst created by the collusion of too many meanings for him to distill against that creates a dissatisfaction feeling of alienation. You know, I mean, it could be that. But the point is, meaning is constituted when you decode what I say. Right? And so what, we're, what I'm trying to do and what you as a writer are trying to do are use signs and pick words and fashion them in a way that evokes a meaning in the consciousness of your receiver. Do you guys understand that? It, it's it's a, a best way to say pick the best words. And we'll talk about what they are. Construct them in the best way that your receivers can make sense of them. Right? But it's good to have this theoretical knowledge of that. Encoding, decoding. Very important process. Um... Look, this is just a review, right? Get the tattoo. I'll let you read it during the test. If you get a tattoo, I'll let you read it during the test, okay? Good writing is what? Number one. Clear. clear. And, and the, I think that's the most important thing for writing for mass media is clear. Second, c correct. And what does that mean? You get your facts straight. That it's accurate. Very good. It's concise. What does that mean? Condensed. Very good. Every word should tell. It should be compact. That's concise. And then complete. What's that? Give us the whole message is there. One time I had a student that was in a production of Dracula here on campus in the theater department. On the cover of the vedette, it talked about the play, where it was, who was involved, what day it was, but it didn't tell me what time the play started. So I called the theater department. They didn't answer. I called the box office. They didn't answer. They didn't tell me what time the play started. And I would have gone if that, 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 that article would have told me what time it started. But I didn't go. Because the message wasn't complete. Alright, so we got that. We're going to keep on banging that to the end of time, alright? Why don't you go ahead? To, with the next thing. It's very important to identify that we've got convergence. You probably should write this down and define it. In our modern media era, I mean, that's why we, the, the be book used to be called Writing for Mass Media. Now it's called Convergent Media Writing. What is convergence? Somebody raise your hand. Yes. Our lane converges into another one. When all of the different parts come together, okay? I mean, there's different ways to say it. Increasingly, one business entity is owning a couple TV stations in an area and a couple radio stations in an area. And so then they can kind of pool their resources so reporters for TV can also post um, stories for news. They're sharing. Um, and so... I mean, W E E K works with W D M, or works with the vedette or the pantograph, say, and they can share information. Um, uh, here, here, here's what convergence means to you, okay? It means that when you're working for a TV station, they're also going to ask you if you can post a web story, aren't they? Take pictures. And record it and take pictures. And the example, I don't know if I used it, um, but Woody and Maggie, I mean, I'll have to tell you, we voted for Obama. Well, I actually didn't vote for Obama last time. I voted for the 
the female who was Jewish and was a green, because Obama's going to win our state anyways. Yes, I, that's who I voted for, because Obama's going to win anyways. Now, I was at Obama's inauguration, and I was served at the inaugural ball. It's a great story. I mean, it was cool. I was hanging out with Jamie Foxx and people from Fun, and what's that? And then the other people. Anyways, so I love Obama because as Woody will tell you, he, care more, he cares the most about poor kids, which is our voting issue. But we love John McCain. So we went to go see John McCain when he was up in DeKal uh, DeKalb, not DeKalb County, DePage County. Because that's where John McCain is going. There's a lot of rich people that live there, right? And anyway, so I took my kids there because I think John McCain is an American hero. And, you know, moderate Democrats, moderate Republicans, you know. Anyways, John McCain, I think, was kind of cool. He's the only guy I gave him money recently to. But we're Obama people. You know, let me get that. Anyways, we're sitting there, and a USA Today reporter comes up, and he says, can I interview you guys? And I said, yeah. You know what he did? He took out a video camera. Wait a second. USA Today is what? It's a newspaper. Why are you taking out a video camera? And his answer was, because this way I can use the videotape to write my article and they may post it. I'll definitely post a version of it online and then I can have the video to accompany it online. That's convergence. Do you understand? That's why this class approaches, no matter what you write, I don't care if it's print, video, radio, it needs to be clear, concise, correct, and complete. The other example, I guess, is I am watching the Academy Awards, which is a Super Bowl to me, okay? I'm watching the Academy Awards. I'm on Facebook with one guy, uh, Xavier Jackson, a really good friend of mine who's in Houston, Texas. And then I'm with another friend in Columbia, Missouri. And we're on Facebook. The friend who's a poet, she's getting all of her results for the Academy Awards from feeds from different news organizations. I'm watching it live. And she and I and Xavier are having a conversation through all the Academy Awards on Facebook while we're watching it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, newspaper wire feeds are informing our conversation. We're interacting with people across the continent while it happens, and I'm watching it on TV. It's this multi-use of all these different media forms that is convergence. And I already told you what it meant for you, but here's really what it means for you. They're going to ask you to do more skills, and you're going to get paid the same or less amount of money. Yeah, yeehaw. Thanks, Mikhail. But that's just the bottom line. If you go in and work for a TV station and they say, can you write for the web? And you say no. But, and, but somebody else says, yeah, I can post to the web. Well, who's going to get the job? The other guy. I mean, I, you know, I don't even, I mean, I may pick up the vedette. Of the, I don't read the pantograph in print form unless it's somebody left it there at the coffee shop. I go online and read it. New York Times. Do you guys even read the New York Times? I mean, I have, um, uh, okay, you, you read it, but uh, do you buy it, the paper? Well, that's good for you. Let me tip you off, though, dude. It's free if you got the app. <laughs> But no, 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 you don't get to get into the meat of the article, and you have to pay extra, don't you? Okay, 10 articles a month. There he is, the man's telling us. They are going to make money off of my app, too, right? And if I'm really, really interested, I'll look. This is convergence. You guys understand? And it doesn't matter what you write for. You want it to be clear, correct, concise, and complete. Even in 20 years, when they just put electrodes straight into the brain of your receiver, and a mental picture is created. Do you understand? It doesn't matter what it is. Web, TV, cable, any form, be clear, concise, correct, and complete. You understand that? You're going to be able to take the basic knowledge from this class and apply it across the board, which is convergence. Go ahead. <clears throat> and what else are you going to do, ladies and gentlemen? Tell a story. Tell a story. Write it down. It makes it so much more enjoyable for listeners. How many people have seen planes, trains, and automobiles? Yeah, there's a point where they're on the plane or later on, and, and Steve Martin's like, you know, all these, not everything is an anecdote. You know these little pithy sayings that you have? Here's a suggestion. Have a point. It makes it so much more enjoyable for the listener. Tell us a story. We don't just want facts. I mean, it's fine that Dave Matthews dropped 
His van dropped sewage on the old people. You guys know that story a couple years ago? His tour bus was over the Chicago River. And while he was on stage, like one of the band crew members just dumped the sewage through like, I don't know, Lower Wacker. And like this tour, bu uh, tour boat of all these re rich retired people were on it. They're all in their Sunday business and like they were covered with, <laughs> with Dave Matthews feces, okay? <laughs> Look, I may just be interested in that. If you're a Dave Matthews fan, you're going to want to go deeper. And that's what's cool about the web. You see the lead, and then you can go and pay for the in-depth article on New York Times app, okay? Um, but tell me a story about it. After you give me the lead, tell me a story. Little old 98-year Maggie May, who's one of the top socialites in Chicago, um, was covered in urine and feces. You know, tell me a story about it. How the night started for them and how it was like their 50th anniversary and they were with all their best friends and the night suddenly turned bad. What? What's that? Her mink coat covered. How am I ever going to get this out? Anyways, tell us a story. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Those people who were there can, are witnesses and they help tell a story. Not just give you the facts, but tell a story. Okay? And we'll talk more about that than we have. Go ahead. And, and when we talk about that, um, that, we're going back to that idea of the dramatic, that dramatic model. Now, go forward, forward, forward. Okay. Then we have structural considerations. You guys already know this too, right? Right? You should have unity, which means what? All the things stick together. Uh, we uh, should have variety, which is what? Yes. Yeah, different news elements. The music changes. The characters change. The settings change. That is variety. How about pace? What is that? Yeah, how fast or slow the difference between a Corona and a Jimmy John's ad. Um, and then climax is, goes right back to telling a story, right? What is the definition of a climax? <laughs> what is at the highest intensity? The peak. Yeah, the, the tension related to the dramatic question is its most intense, right? So there you go. Uh, and some of that is review, but you know, go forward. You want to live it, love it, learn it, know it. Go ahead. We have talked about the transactional model, the purposes of communication, message types, theoretical communication, characteristics of good writing, and structural considerations. Now, I want to go to the second part of this chapter and see how much we can get through in five minutes and look at various media theories. And I don't need you to know what all media theories, okay? But this is mass media theory in a multimedia media a multimodal media environment. Go ahead. And so we're going to just, understanding theories, theories helps us as convergent media writers to more effectively reach intended audiences. Go ahead. And what I want you to understand is that there's been, and you don't need to write this down. Well, you can write this down. There's been a big swing in the first hundred years of media about how much media impacts us. Does it control our minds? Or do we pick and choose, and we let it roll off us, okay? And you don't need to know. I, mean, I guess you could say mass society theory, they were first worried that all traditional forms of culture were going to be wiped out by radio, okay, and mass media. We weren't going to sit around playing guitars anymore around a campfire. What we were going to do is just buy records. And so we would kind of lose our ability. We weren't going to jam in our garages anymore. We were just going to play guitar. What is it? No. What's the video game? Rockstar? Rock band. Yeah. What? Or Guitar Hero. Okay. And then we'll act like we know how to play the guitar. Anyways, how wrong they were. Um, but go ahead. I just want to note this is kind of public opinion form formulation with Walter Lippmann. And you don't need to write this down. He just suggested that new radio and um, newspaper increase the amount media messages con con uh, contributed to public opinion, right? I mean, before that, we got messages that took a long time to get us, but, you know, this public opinion formulation suggested that maybe a media does influence our opinions about things. Go ahead.
And all this is in the textbook. Now propaganda theory suggested, well, for the purpose of like pumping up our patriotism, for what is propaganda? What is propaganda? Yeah. It's Dalton. Is it Dalton? I'm sorry, what's your name? Nick? Nick? Okay, great. I, uh, sorry, pardon me. Propaganda is what? So propaganda is, uh, in other words, kind of this material created to, like, kind of, like, strike a message of nationalism. Yeah. And, and what's the difference between propaganda and patriotic message? <laughs> what? Propaganda, uh, propaganda does what? <laughs> Does patriotism do that? I mean, during 9-11, was there an enemy? I mean, Iraq was the enemy. I mean, none of those guys crashed anything into anything, but there wasn't, they were our enemy, right? Positive, what? I don't think that it's necessarily war. I think it could be any kind of message that persuades the audience, usually pass out through literature, but it can be seen through TV. And he spelled propaganda wrong. Yeah, okay, well, we'll, we'll blame. We'll pl blame Amanda Peterlin for that. Yeah. Um, really, the difference between propaganda and effective mass media message is whether you agree with it or not. If you don't, it's propaganda. If you do, it's like patriotism, you know? But for certainly the Nazis use propaganda, and then we use propaganda. Why We Fight series, a whole series of documentaries in World War II produced by uh, Frank Capra that was... The, intended to promote um, our patriotism. But the idea that certainly is a group of theorists that says that mass media messages can be used as propaganda. Go ahead. And again, now I would write down Frankfurt School. This is important. Marcuse is going to be on your test. Okay? Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse, identified that all mass media is intended, or much of it, to create artificial need. Marcus, artificial need. You need to know those phrases. His name was Herbert Marcus, and he talked about consumer culture. Don't worry about from so much, okay? Everybody look at me. You need to know Marcus, and it suggests that mass media creates what? Artificial, artificial need. need. Write down want, write down the word want, and then write equal not need. Just because I want something doesn't mean I need it. But what does mass media advertising do? They try to convince you that you need it. I gotta have it, man. I can't live without a cell phone or my baby's mama. My babies are gonna get harassed by inbred clam on the highway at night. Remember? And I bought a cell phone. They convinced me I needed it. Okay? Herbert Marcuse says that much of mass media is from that. And, and the Frankfurt School are theorists that came out of Nazi Germany really afraid of the impact that mass media can have on our attitudes. Okay? So Frankfurt School is very important. Marcuse, we'll talk more about him later. That's something that you would want to know. Now, all these guys that were scared about how much impact media had, the pendulum kind of swung back. And it says, look, there's a limited effects paradigm. And that says, look, TV can say all they want. Or radio can tell you black is white forever. But if your friends and your parents and your church and your teachers say, no, black is still black, then... Mass media isn't going to control how you think because there's all these other mitigating factors that are there to tell you the media is wrong. All right? So media really doesn't have that much impact. And this is the eliminated effects paradigm. Why don't you go ahead? And then there's kind of a swing back to moderate effects. Well, look, 2% of our GNP, every dollar you spend, two cents of it goes to advertising. Do you know why? Advertising works. And this was the big thing. It's during the 60s. A guy named Clapper, he said, I work for CBS and I can't give, they won't even give us the studies and show us the studies that show advertising works because CBS paid for those studies. But, but limited effects theorist says the reason they're buying advertising is because advertising works. So there is some limited moderate effect from the mass media. Okay? Go ahead. You definitely need to know agenda setting. Agenda setting. This will be on the test. 
Agenda setting says, they might not tell me what to think, but they certainly tell me what to think about. Okay? They might not tell me I need to think this way or that way about Obamacare because I've got other people that are telling me different things, but they do tell me that thinking about Obamacare is important, all right? So where do I get most of my news? Well, I often watch Fox News is big on my TV. I also switch back to uh, CNN or MSNBC, but usually my news source is The Daily Show. And it's not because they tell me what to think, but they tell me what the media is talking about. Because what the Daily Show and the Colbert Report does is say, these are the stories that they're telling you to think about. Agenda setting is the media may not tell you what to think, but they tell you what to think about. Okay? We're going to continue. Now, hold on. We're going to continue this conversation. We got no choice but to continue this conversation on Wednesday. But I also need you to look at the next chapter, which is what? What is chapter 3? The writing process. Be prepared to end this chapter and talk about the writing process on Wednesday. Are you ready to rock? Thank you very much for talking about mass media theory with me.